Hi, you're listening to Stefan Plavera Podcast, a show about Bitcoin. So, if you are a Lightning Network user on Bitcoin, you might have heard some discussion around the idea of offers. This might be the next big thing in Lightning. So, Rusty Russell of Blockstream, working on the Lightning specification and also on C Lightning, he rejoins me on the show and we talk about this idea of offers. What, how would it contrast with the current invoices that we use today in the Lightning Network, those things that you scan and pay with your wallet? What would be some of the new use cases, such as the ability to have static QR donations or to get refunds or to have recurring payments? And how does this idea of offers compare with other ideas out there, such as LNURL? And we talk about what's next. So were you worried during that recent drop from 60,000 down to 30,000? It's time to consider setting up an auto stacking plan with my podcast sponsor, Swan Bitcoin. Swan is the best way to accumulate Bitcoin with automatic recurring buys and instant buys. It's really fast set up and it's really cheap to automate your stacking. So if you're in the US, you sign up and it automatically pulls from your bank account using ACH, buys the Bitcoin and withdraws to your cold storage all part of that same fee. Swan Bitcoin takes a specific focus on education and content. So when you're on their email list, you get regular updates on new content. And also Swan Bitcoin are providing free books, such as Jan Pritzker's Inventing Bitcoin and a range of other content. So go and sign up at swanbitcoin.com slash Levera to get $10 of free Bitcoin dropped into your account when you start your stacking plan. Lend at HODL HODL is a peer-to-peer Bitcoin-backed lending platform, so you can lend out stablecoins or borrow against your Bitcoin, and there's no KYC. It's globally available and it's anonymous. Lend at HODL HODL is a way to earn extra income on your stablecoins. You can lend them out at an average of 25% APR. On the other hand, if you need some fiat, you can borrow against your Bitcoin, and you still hold one key in the 2 of 3 multi-signature escrow, controlling your Bitcoin during that loan. HODL HODL does not hold your funds. Lend at HODL HODL allows peer-to-peer lending and borrowing directly between users. So with this platform, you set your own terms and put up offers depending on how long you want to borrow or lend and the interest rate. Go to lend.hodlhodl.com. This is a fantastic time to get involved with Bitcoin mining. CompassMining.io are making it easy for everyone to start mining Bitcoin. You can go to the website and choose an ASIC and get that delivered to a hosting facility that you also select, which has also been vetted by the team at Compass. Then you select your mining pool that you want to join and you will then be receiving Bitcoin and paying the associated electricity and hosting fees for that. Now, this is a great way to get involved and get started for those of you who are new and you're not sure about the best way to get started because you don't need advanced technical knowledge. Compass Mining have already vetted some of the options for you because they're making it easy for everyone to access the economies of scale and industrial power rates as opposed to the residential power rates that most people might be able to get. So go to compassmining.io and start mining Bitcoin today. On to the show with Rusty Russell. Rusty, welcome back to the show. Thanks. It's always good to be here, Stefan. So, Rusty, I know you've been uh, making progress on this whole offers idea. Now, you've mentioned this on the show in the past and and in fact, I recall uh, at the Lightning Conference, and I think it was October 2019, is where you actually first put this idea out there into the wild. So do you want to tell us a little bit about how you know, this idea started and where it's evolved from? Yeah, absolutely. So we've, you know, early on, we had Bolt 11, which is the current specification that you know, describes the strings that you use to pay invoices, right? And it starts with LN, BC or something. BC1, yeah. 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 Uh, so... That's that. Like I came up with that um, in the really early days of Lightning because we needed some way of presenting. Like, here, send me some money. Okay, so here's here's the thing, right? Um, but it was pretty primitive and quite limited. And so we, along with thinking about you know, what's the next step, like you know, what, where do we go from here? And uh, I procrastinated for a few years, and finally we had the Ellen Conf. Like, what am I going to talk about? Oh, okay, great. I'll, I'll I'll get this ball rolling, and we'll talk about talk about this stuff and, and see what people are interested in. Because the ecosystem had grown, right? It wasn't just like the three three companies kind of implementing stuff and, and you know, and nobody else cared, right? So, um, so that was that was the intro. Um, I got a lot of really good feedback at the time. Uh, the main question is like, when can we have it? Like, well, you know, we've got to kind of actually spec it out and flesh it out a bit. So um, I had half of the spec written and then kind of, you know, dropped the ball and went, no, September came in, in, in 2020. No, this is it. It's been, it's been almost a year now, right? So let's let's get it out. So September the 1st, uh, the first um, complete 
spec dropped, uh, and there's been a number of revisions since then as people have given feedback and worked on it. But the way this stuff normally works is that, you know, you kind of the spec comes out and nobody really cares. The implementers kind of get together and two of us implement it. Once we're both happy with it, it you know, we announce it to the world, right? Cool, I've got this new feature, you should all jump on board. But this one's a bit different, right? Because offers affects all the wallets and affects everything else. It's pretty big. It's a pretty big deal. So, um, you know, and, and all the other implementers are busy, right? And they've got better things to do than implement this crazy thing that, that's that's kind of far out in the future. So it didn't have that kind of urgency. So having realized that this wasn't going to go that standard way, I went, okay, well, let, let's try the other way, which is to talk to, to the broader community about, hey, we should, here's offers. What do you want from it? What, what you know, here, here's the thing. It's implemented already in C-Lightning. It's this, the second release that we'll have offers in, right? So it's actually been out there for a while in an experimental mode for people to play with. But without the awareness that, hey, this is something you should look at because, you know, now's the time to get in and tell us what's broken, what you like about it, what enhancements it needs, stuff like that. Some of them, you know, will come in future versions, but, you know, let's let's get the ball rolling and go this way. So um, I created bolt12.org, um, which is like a website that kind of summarizes it. And that really seems to have caught people's attention and people who wouldn't normally sit down and like read, okay, I'm going to read. Well, 1200 lines of the spec, like, oh yeah, that's, that's great. Um, can, can kind of get a summary about what the hell is this? So what's this about? And um, and it's led to this kind of feedback and excitement, which is great. Um, and I've already had some really good feedback from developers. Of course it is, you know, it's a big thing to implement, right? Well, authors have got to kind of understand this new format. And in some ways it's more complicated than what they've had to do before because it puts, it has more capabilities. You can do more stuff. Right. So, you know, we're, we're going through that right now. Uh, in fact, you know, the last couple of weeks yeah. has really picked up. So it's really good timing to be be on your podcast. So so let's let's rewind back a step and then just give us a bit of an overview. What is offers like? What what is an offer compared to just doing an, a standard Lightning invoice? So I guess just for listeners who are new, maybe you've never used the Lightning network. You might have had a phone wallet and you might have scanned that invoice, and then you might have scanned and maybe you might have seen it written out as LNBC blah 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 blah. What's offers? What does that have? Yeah. So you basically, yeah, you scan the QR code and make the payment, right? But that QR code that you scan, uh, which is actually just a string LNBC something, uh, is, a, is a Bolt 11 invoice. And it's it's single use, right? Um, it says, here, you know, send me this money and I'll send you the secret that maps to this this hash, right? Um, and so it's a single use deal, right? So I'm supposed to prepare one for everyone who might see that. So you come to me, I, you, know, you hit order on my webpage, whatever. Um, you should, I should give you a fresh invoice, right? absolutely not reusable. I mean, you can send them out on Twitter, but it's a really bad idea, right? Because once that secret is out there, anyone who has the secret can collect the money, right? So it's a single use thing, right? It's a one-time thing. And that's to do with the way the Lightning Network works and the way that the Bitcoin protocol allows us to enforce that. So this is single use, but that's really kind of pretty primitive, right? You want something that you can, you know, just print statically on your web page, and anyone just goes and you know uses it, right, and everything else. So the way we do this is you actually reach through the Lightning Network when you see an offer. It just tells you, okay, here's the description, here's everything, um, and you reach through and get the real invoice from that. And then, of course, it gives you a unique invoice that you pay, right? So it is kind of a two-step, which makes it, in theory, a little bit slow. But in practice, you kind of have to probe the network a little bit these days to figure out, you know, who's live, what's what's working, everything else. Um, and hey, you might as well send a real message, right? So you end up kind of fetching the offer. Then you go, cool, well, I, I know that um, I've got the invoice now. I know this path worked. Let's let's use that for payment, right? So uh, it actually works, works surprisingly well. Um, but this two-step lets you do a whole pile of things that we couldn't do before, right? So firstly, it, it, it's a static. It can be a static thing so that, um, you know, you could get it you know, paint it on your mural that you want donations for or just slap it on your web page. You don't have to have any dynamic content, which is much, much simpler. Um, it is, uh, it, it provides some some stuff that, that I actually really like, which are more advanced features that I think we're going to love in the future. Um, one of these is this idea of a payer key, right? So at the moment, um, uh, I, I pay my invoice and I get the secret. And I can prove to anyone, hey, here's the invoice signed by Stefan's node and here's the, the pre-image. So I can prove that somebody paid this. The problem yeah. is I can't prove that I paid it, right? Yeah. Um, in fact, Stefan could can always fake that. You could always go, yeah, of course you know all the pre-images. So you could, yeah, no, no, here, this was totally paid. So, you know, if, if I post a tweet, no, see, Stefan, I did pay you. Um, and anyone <laughs> yeah. else can go, no, see, I paid you too, right? No, it was me, it was me, right? Yeah. So you know, with this, this, this kind of like, so I'm Brian The idea problem. is that only uniquely you could prove it and not other people. 
That's right. So we want this way of saying, I can prove it. So I actually throw a payer key. When I go, cool, can you give me an invoice and put this payer key in there? And that's obviously a key that only I have a secret to. And uh, you, you sign the invoice and the invoice contains the payer key. This is, this is, this is the person, or this, is, this is the identifier of the person who did it. Um, and so later on, if I want to, I can prove, obviously, I own the payer key. I, I can prove I paid it. I can prove I held the payer key. Well, obviously, it was me, right? And, and nobody can fake that. You can't even fake it, even as the vendor, yeah. right? So um, I, you know, I have this kind of unique proof, um, which, is, which is really a nice feature to have. Um, and there's, there's a whole pile of other things that we can do. Um, one of the things people are really excited about is this idea of recurrence, right? So an offer can say, hey, fetch an invoice, but you should fetch an invoice regularly, right? You should do it once a minute or you should do it once a month, right? This is the Patreon kind of model, right? Where, hey, here's an offer to sponsor me. And, you know, it's like five bucks a month or whatever, right? And interestingly, when you start talking about recurrence, everybody goes, well, that's really exciting. Um, and vendors, of course, love recurrence. They love it in credit cards. Uh, but obviously, everyone hates it in credit cards because it's, it, you have to ask them to stop pulling money out of you, right? Which credit creates this really perverse incentive. But in the Lightning world, there's no pull. It's always push. So you're, you sign up and go, cool, yeah, yeah, I'll pay you once a month. But you want to stop paying it? You just tell your wallet to stop paying it. It's done, right? Yeah. There is no pull, right? So it makes it, I mean, it makes it convenient, which is good but it leaves the user in control. And this whole thing about sovereign control of your money is really, really a fundamental Bitcoin principle that this, this is perfectly compatible with. So, yeah. so I'm actually really excited about that as yeah. well. Um, but you know, so when you start thinking about recurrence, you start going, well, pre-hyper-Bitcoinization, you don't actually want recurrence in a certain number of sats, right? And most <laughs> yeah. people want recurrence in, in some currency, right? So you, know, you can do that as well in offers. So you can actually have an offer to like, hey, pay me five USD, right? Now, you know, how, do, how does anyone know what that means? Well, what happens is when you request the invoice, you get an actual number of sats, right? The invoice is literally for Bitcoin, the Bitcoin invoice. Um, so at that point, uh, for recurrence, this becomes really important. So, you know, one month I fetch it and go, cool, and I, I pay, you, pay you some sats. Um, next month, my wallet fetches it again um, and notices the sats number has changed. Now, my wallet is going to need some way of checking, you know, d is this same? What the exchange right? rate is, yeah. What the exchange rate is, because... Remember, I might be in Australian dollars, right? So I may never have seen this USD amount. My wallet, the first time I'd have gone, cool, uh, Stefan wants, you know, instead of five USD a month, it presents me, hey, Stefan wants like, you know, eight Australian pesos a month, right? Um, and I go, yeah, plus or minus 10%. Yeah, that's great. And so then it gets the next invoice from you and it goes, huh, that's within the range that's authorized because you said eight. Yeah, it's still there. Good. Or it comes up and goes, hold on. Wait, no, that, that seems a bit high. And then it's going to have to prompt the user again. Oh, you just, do you want to keep paying this? Because Stefan seems to be ripping you off, right? <laughs> He's actually asking for a little bit more than, than you're getting a to. dodgy exchange rate. That's yeah. right. You, you could be using a dodgy exchange rate. You could be trying to, trying to tweak things. And uh, of course, there's a security problem. Like, how do you trust the exchange rates? The only th mitigating factor of that is wallets already do it. Right? You yeah. practice every wallet is converting to the exchange rate. Um, you know, you can have some sanity checks in there, right? You know, hey, wow, well, is Bitcoin like really dumped because it seems to be really high? You don't care. Like, if, if you ask me for less money than than I expected. I'm like, yeah, cool, whatever. <laughs> if, if you think that's five bucks, great, go for it. But if on the upside, you probably want to have some control. So there's going to be some UX issues around that. Yeah, yeah. But it is critical. Um, and in the normal cases, this is the kind of thing that people are really, really looking for. So, you know, that's an exciting thing about offers. Um, there's some little stuff in offers as well. It's like, well, you can add a payer note, right? Which is has no real purpose other than if, if I'm sending you like, hey, I really love that podcast. You know that was fantastic. So you can see the payer notes coming in, uh, and they get they get put in the invoices, which is pretty nice. Um, there's we talked about this proof. This hey, I got the payer key and everything else. In Bolt uh, eleven, you can kind of prove that uh, you paid an invoice, as I said before. But in order to show that it was really an invoice from Stefan, I didn't just make it up. It has your signature on it. Yeah, but the signature signs the whole thing. So I have to give you the entire, here's the whole Bolt 11 string that I paid. And that could contain some some personal information that I may not right. want to leak. Um, particularly- Like your like a node ID. Yeah, yeah, it could contain a node ID. It could contain all kinds of things. So um, one of the things we did in Bolt 12 is it actually signs this Merkle tree, which is a fancy way of saying that you can hide some of the pieces in it and still check the signatures valid. So I can prove, I can show you, here's the payer key, here's, um, you know, here's Stefan's node ID, here's his signature and all those pieces. And here's the description of what he promised. But I'm not going to show you the rest, right? I'll just give you a proof of that. Yeah. Um, so yeah. It, it, it's a nice, these yeah. little design tweaks of things that we learned through experience of stuff that we wanted in Bolt 11, and it was time to go around to get. Yeah, yeah. 
there's some examples that I can even come to mind already. So as an example, let's say some lightning podcaster, he wants to do a lightning Patreon using yep. an offer, hypothetically, like I'm imagining, right? And he wants to have a little chat community only for people who've paid. Yeah. And that's where, again, payment proof could come into <laughs> that and say, oh, see, uh, you're allowed into the chat group because you you made your payment for the month or whatever, yep. like just an, as an example, right? Yeah. That's one example. That, that's an easy thing to do to use that pair key because presumably I will not be the only person who has it. Um, now, the other case where pair key comes in incredibly important is for refunds, right? So the way the state of the art in refunds is pretty much, you know, uh, the vendor says, oh, crap, sorry, we didn't have your thing. It turns out, you know, this, this happens, right? Um, and uh, so you send them an invoice to get your refund back. Um, now, that, that has a couple of problems. One is that if you've already leaked your, you know, your payment secret somehow, then, then how do they know, right? The other problem is that every node on the, on the route potentially has your payment secret. Um, although that's solved with PTLCs, uh, it is potentially a problem. Um, whereas with the payer key, I can prove that it's me. Yeah. Right? In fact, there is a specific offer flow for what we call a send invoice offer. So most offers are like, cool, ask for my invoice and, and you know that you can pay me. There's also the reverse case. You're like, cool, actually, I want to send you some money. right? Um, and there's a specific refund field that says, hey, actually, I want to send this guy some money, right? So, so present the payer key, present the, your signs, sign the request with the, your payer key, um, and put that in an invoice, right? So through the network, again, your wallet goes, cool, sends it, gets the invoice back, right? Sorry, you, you send the, I send the invoice back to you, you send me the money. Now, this introduces another problem that we have today with the manual kind of flows that we have, which is that when I send you an invoice, I'm telling you where my note is. Now, normally, this is, you know, we have this asymmetry in the Lightning Network where vendors are known, they generally have a known node. If you want to send to someone, you need to know where they are, but they don't know who's paying. And that's a real feature. It's an incredibly important privacy feature. Why do they care? They actually have the money. They got the money in their hot little hands. Um, so they don't need identity information in this case, right? They don't, yeah. It's not a credit system. It's a, it's a payment system. So they've settled. They've got your money. That's fine. They don't need to know where it came from. But then, of course, you need to dox yourself to get a refund at the moment. Right, which is really bad, right? So yeah. you want your money back. Well, I'm afraid you're going to have to tell me where your note is. So, um, and this is why it's really important that we have blinded paths inside um, offers, right? So you basically go, here's an invoice, but I haven't told you what my note ID is. I've given you this blinded path, right? That you can stick in an onion and send out on the network and it will get to me, but you don't know where it's actually going. Oh, that's crazy. That's cool. That's, it kind of reminds you of like the whole trampoline routing idea, right? Yeah. So, and this can be used to in the, in the normal. Uh, so, in the normal case, this would be used for refunds. But it's also important if, for some reason, you're a vendor. Or, you know, Stefan wants to pay me back for a beer or whatever, and you know, send, send me five bucks. And um, I don't really want to give you my note ID. I can give you a, and you know, I can say here's here's the thing. Uh, here's the invoice. It has a blinded path in it. Right. Even though my note is actually public, you wouldn't know that. Or you've got to use that blinded path to pay that pay that invoice. So yeah. So then I guess I'm curious then, how does, how does your node know how to pay over, like, I'm, I'm a bit curious about how the blinded path works. Could you just elaborate a bit on like how the other guy picks it up, actually picks up that payment? Like, how do you, how does it go? You know? All right. So in the invoice, it says, use this blinded path to pay me. All right. Uh, and I've made up my node ID, right? I've, 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 I, technically, I don't have to, but presumably I have, right? I've just lied. I've made up the random node ID. Here you go. And use this path to pay me. Um, and very carefully in the spec, it says that if you, someone tries to pay that, make that payment directly, pretend you have no idea what they're talking about, right? Um, because of course, I don't want you to probe the network. I wonder if that was Rusty. I wonder if that's Rusty's note. I'll try paying it directly. <laughs> and, so, right. and similarly, the other way, if you try to use this blinded path for anything else, I will go, oh, you know, <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about. So you can't go the other way later on and go, hmm, huh, I've got an invoice from Rusty here. Now let's try using that old blinded path and see if that's actually the same node. Right. So there is some separation of concerns things, but yeah, basically I give you these, this blinded path, you can stick it in the onion and send the message that way. Now we already have something, um, to step back a bit. Uh, we already have something called LN URL, right? Which yeah. does a lot of these things. It has the static property and everything else, but LN URL basically is a web, web layer thing. You know, you have a web server, um, you connect to LN URL, you get the invoice and away you go. And it has some other cool features too. Um, but in this particular case, I really like it being built into the Lightning Network, right? You're not actually doing a web connection. You don't need to set up a web server. You don't need a uh, TLS, you know, you need a certificate and all those things to make the web secure. We already have this Lightning protocol that you're relying on for your payments. So let's just send messages through that. Um, 
and this this is basically completely web, completely lightning native, um, and gives you that that same experience, which I think is is really a key feature as we want to grow. Right. Yeah. And so I guess putting it into practice, then there might be different wallets, and they, and, and if anything, the wallets might support both. They might support LNURL and Office, for all we know. And we'll just have to sort of see what the market chooses over time, what the entrepreneurs and the users choose. Yeah, one of the, one of the first requests I had actually. So um, uh, Shesek, who does um, the Spark Wallet, has been, you know, he's got a, you know, he's, he's 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 basically hacking at the moment uh, on a release that will have Office support. Um, and then one of the first things he said is, I want one QR code that's got the could have LNURL and an offer in there, right? Which means we're probably going to make an LNURL and jam the offer in there. It's it's going to be a bit bigger than you'd like. Yeah. But one of the cute things is that that offers are actually smaller than invoices today, right? And this was this actually came back from the, the Moon Wallet developers who were talking to me about offers, and they went, you know, in developing countries, uh, QR code is a, size is a real issue, right? Um, screens are really crappy. Uh, cameras right, are because the weird. camera might be bad. That's yeah. right. You really want, you know, it's like, get it down. Like, and I'm like, oh, the biggest thing in the offer was the signature, right? Originally, it had a signature fully signed. When I thought about it really hard, I went, you know, actually, we don't need the signature. If you can't validate the offer, when you go to request the invoice, the invoice is signed, right? Which is what you really care about. So we we made the, in the latest version of the spec, we've actually made the um, signature optional. We may actually eliminate it altogether and I just don't even bother, um, which makes it a pretty tight invoice, right? It has a description, it has a node ID, um, may have some other fields like a vendor, may have some recurrence information, um, you know, it may have a blind path. I mean, it can certainly get bigger, but the minimum size is actually pretty tight and it makes a, a nice, um, you know, pretty easy to scan QR code and you can jam a lot more things in there. Of course, when you get the real um, invoice, that goes over the wire, so you don't care, right? Yeah. That could be huge. You could have whole kinds of options. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and that doesn't matter anymore, but that offer size is actually pretty critical. And yeah. that was great feedback that, that I wouldn't have thought of. Yeah, of course. And certainly, I mean, that reminds me of how like Nicholas Berti would tell us about how when he went to El Salvador, El Zonte, he was learning things that he had never learned because he was, you know, previously remote from the location and didn't understand on the on the ground in the real world. What's the what are, what are they seeing? So I guess what it might look like then, I mean, I guess we're sort of speculating a little bit, but maybe it would be like another tab inside your wallet and it would be like, OK, here's your offers. And if you've got recurring things going on and OK, I'm, I'm donating to this person or that person and you, and then you can enable and disable them as you choose, right? Yeah, absolutely. That is um, that's definitely UX flow. So the UX flow is like scan, um, and if it's a simple offer, it will just go pay it, right? And just same as the way it does now. It tells you the amount, and you go yes. Um, if it's recurring, it's going to ask you. Oh, by the way, this this wants you know payment once a month. Yeah, like, yeah, cool, not a problem. It goes into like your recurring tab, all the outstanding things that you're just you know you're streaming sats out for. Right, um, so you can go through and go. Well, what the hell is that? No wonder yeah, I, I, no wonder I bought flaky money. I forgot. I forgot. Oh, Stefan, I meant to meant to cancel. Right? <laughs> um, so uh, you know, you, you basically just have this summary of, of all your payments going on, and you know what's happened. Are they successful? The way that it works. I mean, recurrence is a bit difficult to kind of. Oh, it's, the spec covers the whole all the cases. Um, you know, per minute is pretty straightforward. Per, per, per set number of seconds is pretty mm -hmm. easy. But if somebody wants to be paid first of the month, right? That's not a regular occurrence, but it's a really natural thing to do. So the spec does support that. Mm -hmm. It supports the case of what if you say, I want to pay them 31st of every month? Well, there isn't a 31st of every month. What does that mean? I mean, so that's all well defined. Um, when can you pay? Right. So, so I want to be paid, the, you know, the, the, the pay, I want to be paid the first of every month, but can you pay 10 months in advance? You know, and the answer is no. You basically have to have paid the previous one to get the invoice for the next one, right? You can't just skip. Uh, there, there is a setting that says this is actually a fixed start and you can start at any time. But generally, you have to pay you know, the first one before you can get the, get the invoice for the second one, right? And keep going. And you, by default, can only pay in the previous period or the next period, right? So I can grab the first one. Say it says once a month. I can grab the first one and pay it instantly. That's great. Now, I can either immediately grab the second one or I can kind of, you know, second month, halfway through, I could grab it. Um, but you can actually specify that the invoice. No, no, actually, here's the window which you can pay. Right? This, this, this is this is this is like the the yeah. window which makes sense. Gotcha. Uh, don't go outside that. Yeah. Um, and of course, if you so, so let's talk a little bit. Of, yeah, I, I'm curious as well um, how it would work in the case of like a failure. So let's say there's a payment failure. Yeah. What now? Uh, would they retry or what, how would it how would it work then? Right. So um, 
I mean, that, that, that's a really good UX question, right? So it depends on um, what, what the span is. Like, you know, if, if, the pay, if, if I'm supposed to be paying once a month, right, I've basically got a two-month window to pay this thing. My wallet probably doesn't want to play at the beginning, but maybe five days before the end of the month and wants to kind of, you know, okay, it's time to pay now. And if it fails, you know, try again in 24 hours. Um, you know, maybe after a few times, if, you know, if things are getting dicey, then you pop up a thing. Going, hey, hold on. We're actually, this is stuck. We, we haven't been able to pay this, you know. The node is down. It's been down for three yeah. days in the yeah. industry. So um, if you're trying to pay every minute, then you know you've got less leeway yeah, there exactly. to kind of to, to do that, right? <laughs> um, and you, you're going to want something that's pretty reliable. Um, our fetch invoice uh, implementation in C Lightning is pretty pretty um, simplistic. It basically goes, "Huh, I think I can find a route." Uh, so it tries once, right? And if it doesn't get a reply, it kind of it gives up after thirty yeah. seconds, which is kind of dumb. Um, but one thing that it does do by default is that because not all the networks support these onion messages yet, um, if it can't find a route, it'll just do a direct connection, right? Which is terrible for privacy, right? Um, you're just going connect. Uh, can I have can I have this invoice, please? Oh, no reason, <laughs> you know, right? because by connecting, you're revealing your node ID and everything else, um, uh, and that can be disabled. But by default, for Bootstrap, and this is obviously an experimental feature in C Lightning, you know, it certainly makes it convenient to Bootstrap the network yeah. that way. So connecting and just going, hey, give me this invoice is, is yeah. pretty easy. Um, and as the net network upgrades, we'll get more. You know, uh, we'll be able to just route these things. Yeah. Yeah. arbitrarily through uh, and we'll just do it intelligently we'll, you know, we'll retry and we'll do a few more um you know maybe maybe we'll try a few things at once and stuff like that so so just just to, you know there's, we have to note this gap between like the ideal situation and what is in know, real world in the yeah. experimental implementation today yeah right? uh, it's definitely yeah. Gonna get better but yeah i would expect that your know, wallet will do the retrying stuff and all those things yeah um, gotcha but you know just behind yeah. the scenes and because because you know that happens right of course and then how about from an availability point of view so as an example if that is a mobile wallet and he lost his connection to the internet and now he can't serve you the invoice. Like, I guess these are some of these little practical real world examples where people might have to figure something out in terms of how to do it or to wake it up to receive the payment. Yeah. Things like but that. But remember, they already needed to receive the payment, right? So it already needed to yeah. wake it up. So waking yeah. it up to, to serve the invoice. Usually, um, I mean, the, the default invoice timeout on C-Lining, if I recall correctly, is it, it it's ridiculously low now. If if it comes from an offer, because like they they've just asked for the invoice, they're presumably going to pay it now, right? <laughs> um, yeah. What are you doing, right? Why are you asking for an invoice and then waiting two days, right? So uh, you you've woken me up for this. Let's let's I'll stay awake for sixty <laughs> seconds. Come and kind of hit me with hit me with the invoice, right? Uh, hit me with the payment, right? So uh, so that's that's um, they they can get pretty tight. So usually it's back to back, and that, that's part of the point, right? Is that by requesting the offer, I'm also like, or by, by requesting the invoice for the offer, I'm kind of waking up the node. Cool, I'm ready, um, and I'll find some paths through to you. So I'm like, cool, that's that's a candidate for me to use for payments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. How about okay? Here's another example. What about if there was uh, insufficient capacity, and you know the, that user is on, say, a Phoenix or a Moon or a Breeze, and they need like an on-the-fly channel? I guess that would all just be handled as a normal flow, right? Just a normal payment being made. There's insufficient capacity to receive. Okay, on-the-fly channel creation, something like that, maybe. Yeah, that works exactly the way it does today, which is actually pretty well in those products, right? They 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 do pretty good dynamic balancing uh, and stuff like that. Um, you know, obviously more intelligent. Uh, pay routing will help there as well. We've got like Renee's work on stuff like that, being, making more intelligent use of the channels that we have, um, rather than just throwing more capacity indefinitely. But but definitely that that's something that um, and and to some extent now there's a little bit of anticipation that's possible, right? You know, you ha, huh, I've just issued this invoice. Crap, I um they won't be able to pay that because I don't have capacity. Let's let's do something. Yeah, right. Um, you know, we you know you could see a future a vendor where it would start going right. We you know. Um, it probably wouldn't be a single case, but you know, you start to see liquidity drop, and you'd start going, okay, well, let's let's go out and 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 get some more incoming. Um, and I point here at like Lisa's work on the dual funding advertisement stuff is obviously goes really really well with this model, where in the next C Lightning release, which is probably going to be released by the time people hear this podcast because it's due in a couple of days yeah. from today. Um, it has this experimental support for these dual funding ads. So you basically advertise the liquidity and you go, cool, I will provide liquidity for you for a certain rate. And you know, you'll know you be able to reach out and kind of add liquidity on the fly uh, that way, which I think is pretty important in a completely distributed open way. Yeah, cool. So I guess maybe just to explain for listeners, if you're new, well, essentially when you want to receive on Lightning, you need some incoming capacity. And there are different ways this is being solved. So as we mentioned, say the Phoenix, Moon and Breeze, they like open a channel on the fly, but another way, uh, for example, Lightning Loop, uh, sorry, Lightning, uh, the channel market, uh, the, um, the pool. Yeah, pool, sorry. 
Um, that's one way. And then another way in the, the seat lightning world is this idea of advertising uh, for liquidity. And then you might, um, and then the wallet might intelligently decide, oh, I need some liquidity. Or, or another way is maybe um, that wallets build in some kind of interaction with LSPs, lightning service providers, and you have a relation with, you know, the bit refills or someone else and say, oh, I, I'm, I, need, I need to take some payment. I need some capacity. Hey, let me buy a channel off you. Yeah, and so that's maybe in practice. Yeah, so so it's it, so just just one one thing I want to clarify here is um, C Lightning is the first implementation of the the liquidity advertisements, but it's the spec. So that this is a draft that's in the specification process, and the way the specification process works is you need two implementations that, all, that both work together and you know, have gone through all the details before it gets finalized. So it hasn't been finalized in the spec. We're just the first ones to implement it. So the, we see this is the way. Um, the way these things happen in the future is that there's this open marketplace of you know we already have this gossip network where. You know, talk about themselves, give themselves these cute nicknames, favorite color, that kind of thing. They'll also they also can put in there now. I also supply liquidity at these rates, right? So then you can connect to them and go, "Cool, I'll put some funds in. I'll cover your costs that you've established, and everything else." And you can evaluate, "Hey, sure, this person's cheaper, but this person's better connected. So actually, I'm better off having a channel to them, or I'm already really well connected to them, but not so well connected here." So you know, that's that's a kind of a, a personal note. To Only you will have all the information that you need. Um, to make that call of like, how do you judge the market, right? And it will vary. Um, we've definitely seen a competitive, I want to say, or competitive sport emerge in running profitable liquidity providing lightning nodes, right? So I expect that this kind of open marketplace will take it to the next level with that, right? People really trying to optimize their nodes to provide this service that anyone can rent, you know, can lease liquidity for. I should let Lisa talk about liquidity ads, but one of the really cool things that it is, it's a standard contract for one month. So if you buy liquidity from me, um, the thing is that, you know, I can open a channel with you and promise the world, but at the end of the day, I don't have to route anything through to you, right? So um, one thing that that incentivizes me to do that rather than just take your money and close the channel again and and run away is that um, my channel is actually time locked for a month. Uh, okay. Right? So the terms of the offer that I'm making are: I will tie up my liquidity for a month. I, I might still close the channel, but if I do, my my uh, the, the money coming back to me is deferred for a full month, right? So at the start, you know, and it, it, that of that time, it will reduce as we go through. So I'm committed at this point. So I can't just take your money and run. Um, I, I mean, I, I can, but it costs me. Right? There's no benefit. I might as well just keep routing for you and making routing fees. And one of the other key things that happens is that I promise to you in a way that is signed by my node what the maximum routing fee I will charge people to get funds into you. I see, yeah. Because right? otherwise you could jack, jack up your rates crazy high. Yeah, that's right. It's like, yeah, cool, here's some liquidity, but it's going to cost everyone 5% to use it, right? Which which on the Lightning Network, to be clear, is is astronomically large, right? Um, you know, and, and that's fine as long as you've agreed that to that up front, right? Um, now, at the moment, there's no enforcement system. I mean, at the end of the day... You can charge people what you want, and what can I do, right? You know, um, uh, but um, the protocol does include a signed message from you where you promise that from this block height to this block height, basically this one month period, because again, all the periods are like based on one month, um, you will not have a base fee or a proportional fee more than this this amount. So if you did, I can actually broadcast that on the network. Everybody's not okay. Stefan's being an asshole, right? So so let, let's not use him as a liquidity provider because he doesn't doesn't keep his promises, right? At the very least, or even like, no, we're not going to route through him, or we're going to we're going to ignore. His, his, he keeps claiming he wants five percent. Well, look, we're going to pretend that he's just on the cap, uh, and we're going to pretend you said that, right? And we'll try. And if, if you reject it, well, that's up to you. Um, so that that's a, like a nice defense mechanism for the network. Uh, but that again is not yet implemented. Um, we have the messages, but we don't send yep. them out if if you try to cheat. Um, yeah. So uh, that that's a really important part of market design is making sure that you know there aren't hidden ways that you can try to gouge people. Like everything should be disclosed up front um, and something that you can prove if if someone's misbehaving. Right. That's your the best way to do things is to make sure no one can misbehave. But if they can misbehave, the second best thing is always to have this this way that you can you can publicize that. Right and prove to everyone, hey, you made this promise, and you, you know, you didn't. Yeah, keep it. right. So I expect this to to create a really healthy, dynamic market for providing liquidity for Lightning, which you know we've seen a lot of people jump on trying to do this. So I expect the gamers out there who are optimizing their nodes and and figuring out all their rates will will absolutely love this functionality uh, and creating this open competitive marketplace. So you know, I, I think that's actually going to be huge. And for the end users, for most of us who are not there, you know, kind of, um, you know. Uh, pimping our nodes all the time, 
it's going to be just really good to have all these people competing to provide us liquidity. Yeah, for sure. Right? So, you know, when you start taking your lightning donations, Stefan, on your podcast, and it takes off, right? And you've got all these people, you know, there'll be liquidity providers, like bending over backwards to, to get that liquidity to you so that you can get your money. Right, right? yeah. Right? Which is, you know, ultimately where we want to be. Yeah. Back to the show in a moment. Now, are you sitting with your coins on a Bitcoin exchange or are you using a single signature wallet and you're really wondering about how to upgrade to multi-signature? Unchained Capital can make this easy for you. They have collaborative custody. You can set up a two of three multi-signature setup and in doing so, you can help remove your single points of failure. Even if you've got a hardware wallet, you're still exposed to other points of failure such as your wallet, its backup or even ourselves. So think about this idea of moving to multi-signature. You can have two hardware wallets and get some metal backup products with that. And Unchained Capital can also help guide you into this process. They've got a concierge team who will ship you hardware wallets as well and do the video call with you to get you set up. And then you'll have your own two of three vault. Unchained-capital.com slash concierge and you get $50 off with the promo code Levera. So in Bitcoin, we say don't trust verify. Well, don't trust that piece of paper that comes with your hardware wallet. Get a cipher grid from cyphersafe.io. This is a metal backup product. It is the best value in the industry because you get everything you need for $59. You get privacy by default, the two plates are facing each other. You get a tamper evidence seal. You get an automatic center punch to punch in for those words for the 24 seed words. You can lock it with a padlock. And just like all CypherSafe products, it's stainless steel, it's fireproof, rustproof, and waterproof. So go to cyphersafe.io and use the code Levera to order your cipher grid. Now, as you might know, my favorite hardware wallet is the Cold Card by CoinKite.com. The Cold Card is a specialized machine. You can use it to generate your Bitcoin keys, or you can use it merely to hold those Bitcoin keys that you've generated elsewhere with your own entropy, like using Dice. And the Cold Card can be used air gaps. You use a micro SD card to move the transactions back and forward. So don't be scared, it's pretty easy once you've done it. Test it out with a small amount and check out my recent episode with NVK, episode 290. In that show, we talk about the progression steps and how Cold Card is a great choice for people who want to learn how to self-custody their Bitcoin. Go to coinkite.com and order your Cold Card using the code Levera. Back to the show. Uh, and I think it's, it's really interesting as well because if we go back years and years ago, one of the old school things people used to do was just have a Bitcoin address public and say, oh, if you want to donate to me, I mean, people even do this now, but obviously there's better awareness now about why address reuse is bad. And obviously it's a bad privacy practice to tie yep. a Bitcoin address to your real world identity. And so this is like a potentially a new way that people can achieve something similar, right? Because, and I think, and I understand where maybe uh, some people who were more old time Bitcoiners were like, oh, I remember those days when you could just pay to an address and I could just put it up there and it was yep. cheap enough. I mean, and okay, fine. Even as we speak now, it is relatively cheap. Like it's like one or two sats <laughs> per byte. But of course, we're assuming it's going gonna, it's gonna to go up. But this is another way that maybe using offers, people can have whatever. And, it, it, you know, they can be a, a Twitch streamer or a, they can just have a website and or they, can, they could be out in the real world. They could literally be out in the real world with a stall and be like, oh, here's my little LN offers QR code. And yep. then it's kind of bringing back that old thing, but in a new way that's more... Yeah scalable technologically advanced so that's an interesting point i just wanted to highlight for listeners out there also just to kind of make it practical in your mind you're listening and you're like oh okay this office thing but what would it be in practice you know yeah this is absolutely true so one of the uh one of the the, the people who approached me after the uh, ln conference when i first talked about this was somebody who uh, a company that produces um those barcodes in supermarkets right and they wanted right you know they were like how would we do um how would we do lightning um, on this? And they could, in theory, like you know, you scan it, you pay it, and they refresh the they, they refresh the, the the display, and they put in a, a new invoice. Um, the problem with that is one, invoices are reasonably large, and it's kind of nice that offers are smaller. Um, secondly, these things are battery operated, and they use e-ink displays, so they don't use any power when they're not updating. But it's actually quite expensive to update them, um, which is normally great because it only happens when they change prices. But if they were doing that every time somebody tried to scan the item, it's a lot, yeah. Suck. Right, so so offers kind of solves that, um, but in a you know a low tech way, um, you know this is where you get your donation tattoo, right? You get your offer tattooed on your arm, so people can just scan it and send you money, um, you know, or static web page, right? So this is the donation play case. Um, now polofeed.com already have an experimental offer up, so you can feed the chickens through an offer. Um, the downside of that is that with offers being experimental, the the spec has been updated, and in fact they're using the previous version of C Lightning. And it's incompatible with the, the, the latest offers, so it's in the new version of C Lightning. And, and so this, this is actually something I want to emphasize. 
uh, to everyone is that this is still a draft. This is still experimental. It's a little bit reckless, right? Um, so, so you know, um, be part of the experiment. And absolutely, if you have feedback, and we've got great feedback, you know, if you're using this, you're, you're a wall developer and stuff, and you come across it, you go, like, why did you do it this way, right? Maybe there's a good reason. Maybe we just didn't think of it. So, um, I mean, this is the, now is the time for people to play with it and experiment with it and come back and go, no, this sucks. Um, on the counter side, because that is still happening and still because the draft hasn't been fully ratified until we've got two independent implement, you know, implementations that work together and, and all the wall authors have gone, given the thumbs up and we're pretty happy with all the trade-offs, um, you know, things could change, which means, you know, offers as they are today, you know, we, we could change something and we can't make any promises because we want it, you know, yeah. we, we obviously want the best technological solution uh, when we when we get there. Right, so the trade-off of that is that the early early people are taking kind of a risk that hey, you may have to mint a new offer because you know we change a format or something becomes compulsory. There was optional yeah. or whatever. And as you rightly say on the website, don't get your offer tattooed. Yet. <laughs> Do not get the tattoo <laughs> yet. Okay, plan for it, sure, but don't get it until the until the specs actually ratified. Do not <laughs> do not go for the tattoo. Yeah, and so I think this is also very practical in you know for that use case where someone wants to take donations where previously. If somebody wanted to take donations and let's say they're, you know, living under an authoritarian regime or whatever, I would have had to tell them, hey, get Samurai Wallet and install Paynims and hope that everyone who pays you uses that or install BTC Pay Server, which is, again, quite a big lift for people. Obviously, the BTC Pay Server works pretty much for everyone, but it takes it's a lot of technical ability and skill, whereas this potentially could just be like download a mobile app, set up your offers QR, share the QR and done. Yeah. Look, hey, sneak uh, sneak the QR code out on a postcard or something, and everyone can send you donations. Right? Um, that is definitely, definitely, from in my mind, a huge step up. That you don't need a web server, you don't need all this infrastructure. That you can just you know, do this through offers is, is is definitely what we're aiming for. Right? So, I, yeah, I, I think it's I think it's a game changer. Uh, but you know, this this requires wallet authors to go and implement it. I mean, um, it's been interesting stepping through uh, Nadav, going through Spark, and you know, the changes that he's had, like, had to think about. What's the UX flow like? Uh, how do we keep it simple? You know, what what are the trade-offs with this? Oh, now we've got to have persistent storage because we've got to remember the recurring ones and stuff. In fact, you know, he's pushed off doing the, the first release. He's not going to have recurring offer support, right? But, uh, you know, that, that's, we, we've had to have these, these, these discussions about, wow, okay, this is a whole new side of functionality for the wallet to remember these things, to wake up on time, to pay the new one. And what happens, as you say, like what happens if that fails or you can't fetch it because it's offline and, you know, how do we retry? And, you know, there's this whole, this, this is a step up for wallet authors, right? Um, it also means, and I think this is a direction that wallets are going to go, right? Is they're going to actually start speaking the lightning protocol natively. Now, in a step in that direction, underneath the covers, this Bolt 12 string that starts with, you know, LNO1, um, that that offer is actually exactly the same format that we speak to each other peer to peer on the Lightning Network, right? It is just a Lightning Network message encapsulated in this, you know, uh, Beck thirty two looking encoding, right? So it's really nice letters and numbers, right? But you're kind of like we're leading leading wallet authors to like, well, if you can decode and encode these. You actually now can speak the Lightning Network pretty much. You just need a few different messages and you know a little bit of crypto, and you can talk to. Uh, lightning notes and stuff. So it's kind of, I see what's. I'm, I'm reminded of, um, you know, that movie, uh, Samuel L. Jackson. He's like, lightning, motherfucker, do you speak <laughs> That's it? That's right. It's, <laughs> this is the way it's going to be, right? I think wallet authors are going to start going, cool, <laughs> we can actually reach out natively on the lightning network and start talking to things. Um, in fact, one of the hacks I have for sea lightning, well, I shouldn't call it a hack, it's, and a proposed spec update uh, is, uh, and this will hopefully be in the next version of lightning, is this thing called WebSockets, right? So it's actually really hard to speak Lightning natively from a browser, right? Because browsers can't generally open right raw connections to people. They, you know, they they, they speak web stuff, right? Uh, but there is a web standard called web sockets, and you basically you connect like a web thing, and you go, actually, I want to upgrade this to a web socket, and it becomes a web socket. It's actually pretty easy, and so I wrote a modification for C Lightning. If you connect to us and you're not don't seem to be speaking Lightning, but you then we try. Huh, maybe you're trying to open a web socket. And we have a little proxy that kind of just speaks enough WebSocket to kind of turn to that. And then you talk to us over the WebSocket, use the same crypto and everything else as if you were sending it raw, but you're just doing it from a web page, right? And that opens the ability for anyone to speak to a Lightning node, right? From from anywhere, Android apps, everything else. This is all for, you know, for, for most people, this will probably be pretty obscure, but if you're a web developer, you're like, cool, I know WebSockets, that's easy. So if we give people the ability to connect to the Lightning Network in more ways, it means they can do more cool stuff. Um, the Lightning Network potentially 
you know, it's a payment network, but it's also a communications network, right? It's this network of all these nodes talking to each other. It's got good security properties. It's got some interesting other properties and it is growing. So potentially allowing more people to connect to it feeds that growth and allows us to do some more interesting things that, you know, I'm terrible at predicting the future, but I'm sure people will see this and go, oh, I have this great thing that I can now do uh, with the Lightning Network. So I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. And I'm also wondering, are there any impacts in terms of people out there who might be more concerned with, say, censorship resistance or privacy? Is there any impacts there if, if, if they're using offers as opposed to some other method? Yeah. So um, privacy, the fact that offers have this blinded path thing means that, you know, you, you get a lot better privacy. Um, and even as I said before, you know, not just so, so at the moment, there's no vendor privacy and, you know, the person selling privacy is their nerdity. So blinded path kind of fixes that. But even if you don't care about that case, the refund flow where you are the vendor because they're trying to send you money, um, obviously that's a big hole at the moment, right? Uh, so you're great. You're anonymously sending these, you know, uh, these payments and as the network grows, you know, your anonymity set becomes bigger and, you know, we, we get more confident uh, of things like that and techniques to improve privacy, you know, continue. But, um, but then you hit this brick wall when they go, oh, we want to give you a refund. You're like, well, do I want my money or do I want my privacy? That is a terrible, <laughs> terrible trade-off bad, today. Bad decision, yeah. So definitely, uh, definitely that that helps as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we could basically see this being used. I mean, would you just see it being used like anyone who can use it would use it then because it's smaller and basically even in the standard case, like even if you're not doing the whole donation example, you, you are literally just a normal person who doesn't care, who's not like that strongly concerned about privacy and so on but you're just paying a merchant and you would just use offers because it's just more convenient to do it that way, yeah. right? Yeah, eventually this this will become the standard is the way I see it. Um, you know, we will just use, use use offers for everything and you'll scan it and there'll be this, you know, eventually we drop Bolt 11 compatibility. You go, whoa, whoa, well, that's old school. Let's, <laughs> whoa, who are you? <laughs> you know, why are you doing that? Um, so yeah, we, we will just, it'll all be offers. Um, you can have a single use offer in C Lightning. So it'll only get basically, uh, you know, it'll only, you, you can actually mint one, uh, multiple invoices from it um, because you know you may request an invoice but then not get the reply so you may you did need to support that but then uh, once you pay it that's it the offer's done um, that's really yeah. important for the the send op, send money case where you're it's an offer to send you money obviously you only want to do that once right uh, kind of important um, but a classic example there is ATMs right so ATM at the moment a Lightning ATM it's like well you have to give them an invoice to get your money this way no no they would flash up an offer. You scan it and it goes, oh, that's a that's a send invoice offer. So cool. I will just send them the invoice and they'll send me the money, right? Yeah, um, gotcha. it's it's the same format. It just has a different feel. So hey, actually, I'm not I'm not trying to get money from you. I'm trying to send you money. So you send me an invoice and I will will pay it, right? And obviously that's yeah, I see. by default. So um, that's yeah. already supported in C Lightning um, and pretty straightforward. So yeah, this is sort of the push side of offers, which you know for ATM is really logical. For refunds is very similar in those things. Yeah, yeah, and so that. I guess compares with say LN URL where people might be using that right now to do this kind of LN URL pay, or I, I know there are other forms of LN URL such as authenticate or channel other ones, which I varying support, but I guess then the idea here is offers is kind of operating at a more protocol level and you don't need a web server for that yeah, aspect of it. Absolutely. That's probably the key differentiators there for people to think about. And you know, we, we may be in a world where we're using both for some time. Yeah. You know, it may just be like that. Absolutely. And that's why I think the encoding the, the you know, the, the step where we encode one and the other, so you can have a combo, right, uh, is great. It's rather than having two QR codes, like, oh, you know, do you speak offers? Do you speak, you know, no, that's terrible. Um, right. Just just throw one in. Sort of like a compatibility layer. Yeah. Like wrap segwit, three addresses. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. You know, we do these things all the time, even though we don't think that they're the ultimate, you know, protocol solution, just because, you know, it, it does simplify that transition, right? We, we're not in the days anymore where the Lightning Network is this kind of fun thing where there's you know, five friends using it and we can just go, oh, cool, everyone upgrade and it'll change, right? Now it's like, okay, we've got to plan this, right? There, there are wallets coming out all the time you know, that you haven't heard of. You're like, wow, okay, this is this new Lightning wallet, right? This is a whole ecosystem now. So, you know, it, it, it is a bigger deal to make these upgrades. On the other hand, the biggest growth is ahead of us. So, you know, now's the time to do it, right? It's only going to get more difficult to change in two, three years time. So, you know, and th that's true of anything, but I think for something like offers, it's really important that we kind of get the ball rolling now and, and get that feedback and make sure it's the best that we can it can be. And they go, right, we're ready now. Here's 1.0, let's go. Yeah, yeah, that's excellent. Um, so I'm curious as well, do you have any thoughts in, in terms of the growth of the network? I mean, we're seeing, I mean, it, was, it probably wasn't that long ago 
I think Christian Decker ran those stats back in, was it September or October 2019? And there were maybe six or 7,000 Lightning nodes on the network yeah. then. And as we speak today, it's over 20,000. Yeah. So do you have any views on uh, where, the le- where the network is going and you know, how that growth is coming? Look, that, that, that number is the one that excites me, right? Not the Bitcoin price and crap like that, right? That, the, the number of, and not even the capacity of the Lightning Network, because that's kind of, you know, that, that's a conversation kind of, about TVL and it's a bit nonsense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. What, what's interesting to me is like, how many users are we looking at? Now, some people, liquidity providers are running multiple nodes for various reasons, and I get that. Um, but that headline number of kind of what's going up is, is a really nice thing to focus on, right? So how many nodes are we seeing in the network? And of course, you know, not all the nodes are public, um, but we're looking at that growth. Um, and we see obviously um, async running, you know, Phoenix, uh, seeing seeing great user growth. Um, we can tell because they keep making bigger and bigger channels. They made a 10 BTC channel the other day. It's like, well, they're doing that. They're not doing that for fun, right? They're doing that because they need the liquidity because of all their users, right? So, so we are definitely seeing, you know, uh, yeah, throughout the industry, we were seeing this growth going along. This, 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 you know, this broad user base, and I think that's that that's incredibly exciting, right? Because you know, I've, I've been doing this for six years, right? So, read the read the the Lightning paper originally. Um, no one had a plan to implement it, so uh, Blockstream said, "Hey, Rusty, you should." you're joining blockstream you should you should go implement the lightning network and so you know we had the first implementation we did the spec process we kind of have grown from there there's been you know lightning labs was founded um the async people kind of pivoted to doing doing lightning stuff and it's great so you know from these humble beginnings and there was always a thing of like what if we build this fantastic we could see it right we were like this is going to be amazing what if you build it and then no one else sees it right and we're like ah oh, yeah it's too hard why would i do that you know nobody has bitcoin anyway so why would i use it to spend stuff or or you know well bitcoin's a saving technology so why would i spend it and you know it's like, maybe you know and that that became a big big thing it's like well maybe we'll build this fantastic thing and they won't come right and they'll never yeah we'll be sitting here going we could have changed the world but but it never quite caught people's imagination um and so it's been really exciting with things like you know bitcoin beach and el salvador and stuff to see people going yeah no this really does we get it, right? This really does solve our problem. Um, and, you know, I think our tendency in the Bitcoin world as, as kind of reaction to like levels of hype that you see in crap coins and, and other random scams is to, to kind of really not overpromise, right? You know, it's a bit of a delicate balance, but, you know, we prefer to produce code and stuff that works and then have people discover it and go, wow, this is fantastic, rather than going out and evangelizing, right? It's always pretty uncomfortable to evangelize stuff to people because you're like you start to sound a little bit like you know my shit coin is the greatest thing ever and you should invest right so in fact you know the, the number of you know we talk about lightning in the early days people would you'd have serious people go so how do i invest I'm like, it's not that kind of project it's not you know this is an <laughs> open source project lightning coin rusty <laughs> that's right you know then lightning selling lightning sparks was a running joke for a long time right um that, that just you know uh, so so we tended, you know, the natural engineering response is to like just put your head down and kind of go and, and do stuff. But you do occasionally wonder, hey, is anyone actually, you know, is this ever going to really take off? And it's been fantastic to see people actually go, yeah, this is fantastic. We're using it every day. Um, people like Jack Mallers, of course, building products that, that I had never conceived of on top of the base layer and going, this is the most amazing thing ever. And, and, and doing that next level stuff on top of this open network we're building is, is just an amazing, amazing uh, feeling. But also, you know, a bit, a bit of like, get a chance to like take a victory victory lap and pat on the back like we're doing well yeah so and then you've got a whole then, country who'll be using lightning fan. yeah and then you like get your heads down like right that's it but we've got so much stuff we still got to do you know there's this is really greenfield stuff there is a whole pile of things that you know opportunities that we haven't touched uh technology that we want to improve um you know this is definitely going to keep me busy for the next decade right there is there is so much cool stuff to do at the base layer so that people can do these amazing things that they're building on top right yeah, um, but it is it is it is great to to do that. You know, every time I use the Lightning Network, it gives me a bit of a thrill. Like, holy shit! It just <laughs> like wow, that was amazing, right? Um, yeah, I actually had to I had to I sold some Bitcoin recently uh, because I wanted to buy a coffee machine. This was a big thing. Like, Bitcoin hit fifty k. I was like, right, that's it. I'm going to buy my ridiculous coffee machine because I have these five thirty a.m. Lightning cool. spec calls, uh, spec spec online meetings, and I'm like, no, nah, I need a decent coffee, like a really nice Italian, you know, espresso machine. And I was like, you know, if Bitcoin ever hits 50K, man, I'm going to go sell some, sell some sats and I'm going to get it, right? Um, but it, that, that finally happened. Um, and I'm like, wow, okay, it, it actually happened. I'm going to do it. Um, I tried to, you know, I asked them if they take Bitcoin, they wouldn't. So, okay, I have to sell some sats. I sent people like a thousand bucks over the Lightning Network and it just worked. Right? Just like, wow, I just I sent it. It worked. It was done. And I'm like, holy crap, that was, that was amazing, right? I mean, we never, it was originally always thinking about like really small amounts and everything. Well, I'll try it. 
wow, it just, just worked, yeah. right? And did you and go that, in and the, check if it was like an MPP and all that? Yeah, well, that's right. And I looked at it, it split it all, and it all kind of worked pretty well. I'm like, wow, okay. Um, now for that, interestingly, I pushed uh, a whole pile of sats out to my Phoenix wallet and used Phoenix to pay it. So they had to worry about the liquidity getting to the other side. But it just, you know, I was like, hey, that was, it was just such a smooth experience. Um, and obviously so fast, having done like, you know, local Bitcoins trades where you're waiting for confirmations and stuff like that. Um, and these days, and then paying fees on top, um, just to send it peer to peer and have it done was like, whoa, okay. And even me who had been working on this thing to actually do it was, was a whole nother level. So yeah, it is a real thrill to use it. And, you know, yes, my travel plans include going to El Salvador at some point, you know, when I'm outside Fortress Australia to, um, you know, just to get that whole, yeah, let's just, let's just see this in action natively um, and preach them the truth about Bolt 12. But, you know, uh, to, just, just to go in and, 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 you know, and actually have that day-to-day experience is, is, is amazing for somebody who's been so deep in the weeds for so long trying to get this stuff, you know, forwards. And we're always looking at the problems and stuff like that. To have a moment of kind of going, oh, man, that just worked. And that was amazing. Uh, is, is, it really is a thrill. Yeah, especially for listeners who might have um, only just recently learned about Bitcoin and Lightning. If you had joined and tried to use Lightning, you know, three years ago, or you know, you would have seen you, you might have failed, met, hit payment failures on a fifty dollar or a hundred dollar payment. Yeah. Now, easily, people are doing thousand dollar payments uh, yeah. on the Lightning network. And we've got Renee, um, Renee out there doing some fantastic research on basically how to push the boundaries of that. You know, we're, we're really excited about pushing, putting some of that uh, stuff in because you know, we if if you do if you're trying to hit an edge case where you're really trying to, um, or it's, it's, so there's two cases where we suck. One is where we really have to split in a specific way in order to get it through because it's only just possible. Um, we'll you know often give up before we hit. You know, we'll time out. We'll go a minute. No, we spent too long on this go away. The other case is where it's actually impossible. We will bang our heads against all kinds of stupid possibilities before coming back. And, and Renee's work is much more like, oh, nope, it's not possible. <laughs> Just, nope, it's not going to happen, right? We're, we're, we're underneath the point of one and, and a lot faster, right? Oh, we need to fix this. You know, you need, you need some more liquidity. You, you don't have enough funds or they don't have enough liquidity. Something needs to be fixed. Um, so failing fast, but also managing those edge cases. Um, and one of the things we're seeing at the moment is people just adding a crap load of liquidity, uh, but using it more efficiently is going to be really key as well. Um, but right. again, see, I'm falling back in this mode of going, oh, here are all these problems and stuff. Right? But yeah, look at how far we've come. You know, when the first lightning payment I made did to, to sell a cat picture to uh, um, to Christian Decker back in the day, right? Um, that, you know, I was like, wow, we got it to work between two peers, you know. Um, and then routing payments uh, with async through uh, through multiple node implementations was a huge breakthrough back in the day. Um, and now I just say, cool, not a problem. I'll throw a thousand, thousand bucks worth across, across the network and it just freaking works. Is a, yeah. is a pretty nice. Yeah, I'm also curious as well. So one of the I guess speculations out there is that Lightning adoption would really be driven if we were to hit a high fee environment. So basically, when we pay our Bitcoin fee, having to put a, attach a fee for the miner right now that's quite low. But obviously, if we're all bullish on Bitcoin, we're we're expecting number to go up in fiat price terms and in SAT terms. So I'm curious your view on that, and you know, would how how would Lightning respond in a high fee environment? Yeah, so that's a really good question. So, um, and to some extent, it's like the weather, right? We don't have a huge amount of control over it, so we're just kind of going to make sure that we are prepared for the worst and just just go with it. We'll find out when it happens, right? You know, I I, I like a lofi environment, right? It makes it <laughs> really easy to open channels and and do these other yeah. things, which is fantastic. But yeah, look, we in a, in a higher fee environment, you might start to get more conservative with closing channels, right? So generally, you know, and, and this has been a true trend over the time. Originally, like Sea Lightning was like, we're very much following the spec. If you disobey the spec, we just close channel on you. That was our answer to everything. We don't like you, you close channel, right? Um, you send us something weird, we close the channel. Um, and now increasingly, we get more forgiving. It's like, okay, well, we're going to give you some some breathing room there because, you know, people get upset when channels close because, you know, they lose liquidity, they've got to kind of go again um, and they get the fees, right? Um, so we've gotten more forgiving over time. Um, it may we may eventually get to the point where we go, ah, uh, you did something I don't like, but it's not worth me closing the channel over and do that kind of statistic. Um, you don't want to do that absolutely. You can't let someone get away with everything because you're terrified of closing the channel. At the end of the day, you've got to go to chain to to enforce your rights. But you know th- there is a level there where you go, ah, uh, you know maybe maybe this isn't so important. Um, we see stuff like channel factories coming out where you can basically have multiple channels on top of channels so that you have this base layer and then you operate on top as definitely a mitigation for higher fees. And I think research into that will only really kind of, you know, implementation will only get driven when we're in a higher fee environment. Uh, when people are like, yep, cool, we really want this now. You know, 
as I said before, there's so much to do in lightning that we're driven by pain, right? Uh, you know, yeah, um, right. excitement and pain, right? Excitement, <laughs> this is really cool. We have to do this. Or like, oh crap, you know, we're really hurting. We have to do this. So, you know, I imagine a high fee environment will drive more innovation and things like channel factories and things like that so that we can get, you know, so that we can, we can, we can try to, to work around that. But fundamentally, there is this conflict. If you think of like Bitcoin as your, your arbiter in this case, right? So, so lightning works really well um, when something goes wrong, we go back to Bitcoin and go fix it, right? We've got all these contracts signed. We've got everything signed. Dump it onto Bitcoin and it will enforce it, right? But that's expensive, right? So, you know, we're always going to have this tension where in a perfect world, you know, it, it would be ideally and enforced and everything else. But at some point you go, well, actually, it was 20 sats, dude. I'll just let it go. Um, it's it's not worth enforcing, Um you know, and, and there's statistically there will be some people who go, no, it's principle, man. I'm gonna I'm gonna enforce it to get my twenty cents back. Uh, but but there will be cases where it's just like you know that that's just kind of a cost of doing you know cost, cost of, of doing business. business. And that's yeah. just just physical physical reality is that you know sometimes it's not worth enforcing the theoretical rights that you have because the costs are ridiculous. And we're going to see this layering. Um, and you know, uh, I've I, I I I certainly hope that we never see Bitcoin. Fees hit the point where it becomes untenable to board people onto the Lightning Network, right? So it's a happy medium where fees are high enough that you know you don't just use it casually, but not so ridiculously high uh, that that you go, well, I can't join the Lightning Network now because I have to use someone else's channel. I can't, I can't self custody. So you know, and but again, it's like weather. We don't have a huge amount of control over that. One thing we can do, of course, is try to aggressively squeeze more transactions into blocks, right? That's going to kind of you know use the stuff that we've got better. Um, and that's something that's happening. You know, Taproot and stuff like that is all about squeezing more stuff in. Um, and I've always been a long-term advocate of a block size increase at some point. But you know, it, that is a much longer-term deal. Um, you know, it would have to be a very conservative increase. Um, and you know, we've never had a hard fork before, so it would have to be, you know, decade in the making. This, this would be a huge deal. We'd get one shot at it. Um, we'd have to give at least five years for everyone to upgrade. You know, I mean, it would be a massive undertaking across the industry. And so we would need to have broad agreement. Um, and we'll probably only have broad agreement after we've had years of pain, right? At some point we go, right, okay, so fees are high. They're staying high. We're sure they're enough to support the network, but they are getting uncomfortable. Is it time to start talking about this again? And because of the previous experience with, you know, YOLO block size increases and stuff, um, there's a natural reaction against it. You know, there are a number of people who are like we were never going to increase the block size. I think that's probably perhaps a little bit too much as well. So, you know, that's a whole conversation that we have to have. Um, but look, you know, the, even today, Lightning Network is taking a lot of the pressure off um, the block size thing. So that can't continue indefinitely, right? Because because we will grow, and we will get more of this stuff. But you know, it, it it changes. It really does seem to have changed the the number as far as how far out before fees go up, right? We're going to see if we can see a lot more growth in Bitcoin before we see fees skyrocket, which I think is fantastic. Yeah, interesting points. So the, I'm reminded here as well. So the number people throw around is something between 100 million to 200 million ish. That's not how many people who hold some Bitcoin today in the world out of the 8 billion humans on Earth, right? Uh, now, many of those are not cust you know custodial, uh, as in many of them are custodial users. They're not holding their own keys, but of course. Over time, people will sort of come down the rabbit hole and learn and they will start want to use the chain. And then, boom, there's going to be all this demand coming. And so I think the projection, I can't recall who made this projection, but someone said we might be looking at 1 billion users in 20, like in five years. And so that's kind of crazy when you start thinking about that because, you know, if we were to hit a 5 or a 10x, you know, let's say, you know, we hit like a 10x in a year or two or whatever, like that, even that would start causing a lot of... Um, on-chain impact, right? Because then you, you, you're going to have to be more careful about who you open the channel with because maybe they're not as trustworthy a partner or because you're now, you're like, okay, my cost back then, when fees were one sat per byte, I can open channels to whoever. And I mean, it's obviously there's still some risk, but it was less because, you know, but now if the fees were to be like, okay, Bitcoin price goes to 300,000 and the sat fee is, you know, 100 sats per byte, boom, all of a sudden you're paying a lot to open and close channels, right? Yeah. 
So yeah, there's, there's a couple of interesting things here. Basically, it's, it's not so much trustworthy as reliability, right? Your, your, yeah. your partner reliability is kind of important, right? If, if they're not there all the time, then eventually, like, it's, you know, you're gonna have to close. Yeah. Um, now, one of the changes that, that's gone through that, that L and D have have implemented, and the rest of us have kind of been lagging on. We have an experimental implementation, but it definitely needs work and, and see lightning before we can ratify fully in the spec. Is this this um, zero fee anchor output idea, where basically you lowball the fee for your commitment transaction. So if I have to unilaterally close, at the moment, we need to make sure it definitely closes. So we use this high rate fee. There's this trick where we actually use this, this, we can use a lower fee, but then we can use a child with, you know, we, we create a child at the time that pushes that in to the blockchain. So kind of all the fees are loaded in the child. To do the RBF, yeah. Yeah, uh, well, to do child pays for parents. Parent. Oh, so, sorry, yeah, gotcha. Yeah. Uh, because we can't RBF. We, we, you know, Stefan and I negotiated this ages ago. He's gone away. I can't get his signature to RBF it. So I really need, because if I can mutual close, that's fantastic. But if I can't, and I need to go on chain, use the child to push this in. And that lets us decide on fees and how urgent things are at the time rather than trying to guess the future. So that that is actually a big improvement that very much driven by uh, fees increasing and people going, wow, that cost me a lot to close that channel unilaterally. Uh, did I really want to do that? So using child pays for parent is an obvious extension um, that is required a reasonable amount of engineering and everything else. It requires more engineering for us to implement it properly because you then need to be able. You need to have some funds to create a child transaction, right? So LND already kind of uh, sequestered some of the funds out, so they've always got a UTXO so they can use. But what if a lot of these happen at once, and you've got to kind of use the change of one to pay for the other? And you know, it can, it can get quite complicated. And really, you need to be juggling a lot of things in order to get that right. And how urgent is it? You need to start making decisions on well, because you can do this. You know, you can you can you can RBF the child. So you push the child in. You go, ah, oh, didn't go in. Maybe I. Maybe I'll push a bit harder, right? Or maybe I don't care. Maybe I'm like, okay, so I'm, I'm unilaterally closing this uh, this channel with Stefan because he's been offline for a month. But you know what? I haven't had my funds for a month. There's no HLCs in flight. There's nothing urgent about this. I can lowball and just wait. Um, and you know what? If I want to open a new channel, I can use the new channel open to push the old one through. Uh, you can sort of batch things up in a way. Yeah, yeah, batch things up and do batch openings and stuff like that. We already support that in, in C Lightning, so you can basically do multi-opens at once. Um, I did a test on Testnet where I tried to open a channel with every Testnet node at once. Um, most of them failed because Testnet nodes people like throw away all the time. But you know, um, I opened something like 100 channels in a single transaction. And so we'll see more of that uh, where you, people are batching and stuff. But it doesn't really help for the single node user. You've got a couple of channels. You can't really do a huge number of tricks with that. Maybe you could do that in one transaction rather than two. But you know, um, we are. At, at, you know, this is again make things more efficient and squeeze things in. But at some point, really high fees are gonna are gonna hit us. And so we're hoping that you know we keep that under control while we grow the Lightning Network. And once you're on board, then the cases where you have to close as reliability goes up, as people get better at this. And frankly, you know, as people use the Lightning Network more and this stuff gets more polished, um, reliability has definitely been improving and I expect it to continue to improve. But yeah, there'll be the case where uh, I had a channel on Stefan's phone, he dropped it in a lake, and that part of the boating accident, and you know, I'm going to have to unilaterally close and you know, that sucks. Uh, so th there will definitely be on-chain activity, uh, but the idea is to like, keep it to a minimum. Right. And I'm curious as well. So, uh, you know, we were talking a little bit about channel factories and this idea of you know, not just two of two channels, but it could be 10 people in a channel or 100 people in a channel. Do you believe that, let's say we got any prev out at some point in the next you know, few years or five years, 10 years, I don't know, say uh, five, any prev out and we get, you know, we get L2 and we start doing all the channel factory stuff, w would you believe we would still need a block size increase even then, even with channel factories? So the problem is if you don't have a block size increase, then you push people towards more custodial solutions. Um, that's just, you know, like, like if you can't go on chain, you end up in a custodial solution. Um, so that's the tension. Um, at some point, if, if you can't fit everything on chain, you're pushing people away from using Bitcoin. Um, and that, that's, a, that's sort of that happy medium where there's the minimum. Um, there's, and, and channel factories are kind of a middle ground. You have some group uh, that have at least reliability concerns, right? Everyone's got to be alive and active or uh, available. Or if you do some clever N of M scheme, you have to have a trust issue then, right? Because like, what if all the, the 10 of you are in the group, but any nine can vote on stuff and change stuff? Well, now you've got this problem because they might screw you over. So either way, you're pushing people into a model that, that you know, is either a, has a reliability problem or has a trust issue. And it's not, it's fine for those things to exist, but if that becomes the primary use case, it's like, well, the only way you can afford to use Bitcoin and Lightning is if in one of these 
uh, commune style trust things, then you really kind of take, you've taken away people's self sovereignty again. Um, so there's definitely a tension there. Now, on the other hand, in practice, will we see families with, you know, their, their funds in that kind of system? Totally that, that could well happen, right? Um, you end up with aggregating at some small level, a community or something like that. Um, but at the end of the day, people will want to hold their own funds. Um, now maybe, Hey, maybe the cold storage is still their own and they have that one UTXO and yeah, it costs them 50 bucks to open it, but you know, uh, it's sitting there for long-term storage. Um, and then they have their community channel and that works I and mean, people will work around it. And I'm increasingly convinced that people are finding lightning so useful that they will figure out all these things if they have to, but I'd prefer not to push them into that model and have some happy medium where you cool, you can have this community thing, you can have this other thing, but, um, and this, this channel factory and everything else. Um, but it is also reachable for everyone to have, you know, or the majority of people to have a UTXO that they can own. Yeah, so that might be a big uh, disagreement in the in the ten years. Say in ten years' time, there might be those who say no, people should just use custodial, and then there'll be the other people who say no, we demand that every person be able to have their own UTXO. And and you, there could also be, as as you rightly were saying, there is a even in that in between. Even like, let me walk back a second. The concern is more that not everyone on Earth of the 8 billion of us can have a UTXO. Literally, just physically, it cannot happen. And so even if we did say everyone's on channel factories, then you might be in a situation where all your funds are hot. All your money is hot. Like your life savings is hot funds on a phone yeah. or on something. And so you could uh, maybe there would be a, an argument there around that. I, I don't know. And maybe, But I also think there'll just be a lot of people using custodial. So... You know, but I guess that's a that's an argument to be had in like ten years time or something. Oh yeah, look, and 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 our job, Stefan, is to to make sure that the the ramp down. So if you want to come custodial to like more self sovereign stuff like that, to make that as smooth and gentle a uh, transition as possible, right? The more people that we can get cool, no, 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 you can hold your own stuff. Here's you know, here's an easy way of doing it. You know, l- looking for the great trade offs, right, where we can make it you know safer that safer than custodial, but not like crawl over broken glass kind of painful to do um, is, is is that is the Bitcoin battle, right? To get people to actually use it, um, not just hold it in some you know some, some indirect sense, but to actually be have Bitcoin um, you know, have their keys is is I think the defining Bitcoin battle. If we fail at that, then we haven't you know we haven't won, right? If we don't actually have people controlling their own Bitcoin, um, you know, we've got some nice monetary properties, perhaps. Uh, although those can then be erased by the custody, you know, th- those can then be erased by the custodians as well. So, you know, we haven't really achieved unless we've got a significant portion of people who actually are holding Bitcoin as such. So, you know, I, and, and you know, I think again, this is an argument that we're going to have, and there's a lot of nuance around this. Right? There's no obviously correct answer. Um, but we're, there's going to have a, a gradation of different of different answers, I think. Right. Yeah. So uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, how that happens. Uh, who knows? Maybe there'll be some other technology that comes out and sort of helps in some way with all of this. But uh, I think probably a good spot to finish up here, Rusty. So for any listeners who want um, who want to help out, or are you, what sort of feedback are you looking for on offers, and how can anyone get involved? Right. So um, the bolt12.org is the kind of go-to place for, for stuff, and I'll be gathering resources there. Um, it has a link to the text of the of the spec, which actually is not that unreadable, right? If you're a technical person, you can kind of read through that. Oh, cool. I, that makes sense. Um, I always welcome questions. I'm pretty accessible on Twitter. Uh, my email is pretty well known, rusty at blockstream.com, um, rusty twit. Uh, Randy, Rusty underscore twit on Twitter. Um, reach out to me, uh, any questions. And if you're a wallet dev or something like that, then please please definitely reach out to me and ping me and talk to me about your interest and everything else. Um, I'm thinking about actually running a series of seminars on, on, on Bolt 12 um, to actually run people through the technical stuff, right? If, if they're, they're what does, they're kind of interested, um, what do they have to do? Like, so I want to do Bolt 12. How do I do it, right? What, what steps do I need and stuff like that? Um, so I'm looking at maybe doing that, that in a few weeks' time and just you know, some live, live interaction with people on, you know, on their questions and stuff like that. A bit of a review club for, for Bolt 12 I think would be useful too. Fantastic. Well, I enjoyed chatting with you, Rusty, as always. So uh, thanks for joining me. Thank you, Stefan. Just a quick note before we finish up, I'm also speaking at some conferences coming up. So there's BitBlock Boom at the end of August, that's in Dallas, and also TabConf.com. So that's the Atlanta Bitcoin Conference. That is November 4th to November 6th. And if you go to TabConf.com and use code Lavera, you get a discount on your ticket there. For those of you who want the show notes and the transcript for this episode, go to StefanLavera.com slash 298. That's it from me. Thanks, and I will see you in the Citadels. Mm-hmm.